Last week I tackled a project that's been on my to-do list since December, carving a giant six foot spoon. Which might seem odd, but I've been excited about it since my best friend, Anna Ball Trades, came to Texas and taught me how to carve a regular size spoon. During this project, I talked about liking out of proportion things and carving a giant spoon, and then brought up making an equally giant draw knife so that it looked to be carving the spoon. It was way too cool of a project not to actually make. So, now that you know why I did it, let's get into how I did it. I'll be using the cutoff 6x6s from building my shop's porch earlier this year, as well as the cutoffs I've been storing from building my last shop's porch back in 2016. And I will tell you this, trying to be sentimental with my material choice cost me a lot of time and effort. It would have been okay. far easier if I would have just bought brand new 6x6s, but it was worth it to me. The plan is to take the material I have, plant it down, and do two giant glue-ups. Then combine the two glue-ups into a single massive block of which I could then carve a six-foot spoon. I started by placing the post in my super jaws and using the seven-inch Triton planer to clean up a few sides on each of the cutoffs. Wow. This was my first time using this tool and man did it do a great job. The deck is so large, it is extremely easy to keep flat the entire pass. I stacked the posts together and even though the sides were nice and smooth, they were not exactly flat. Each one of the posts has a bit of crown to it. Of course, I couldn't glue up the boards together like this, but thankfully, my neighbor is a woodworker and let me use his jointer, which is such a cool tool. It only took a single pass to knock each cutoff down flat, where now when I stack them, they laid perfectly flat up against one another. I jointed each face that needed to be stuck together to another face, and you'll see later why this step made all the difference in this project, because it allowed me to have a very nice and strong glue up. This is pretty nerve wracking, so wish me luck. After doing a dry test fit where I marked all of the glue surfaces and labeled the order of the post, I started sticking things together. This is going to be an outdoor sculpture, so I used waterproof Type Bond 3 wood glue. Pouring the glue directly onto the faces and using a scrap piece of wood to move it around. This is a really quick way to spread it on such a large area. And I did move quickly since I had so many surfaces to glue at once. Then I pulled out every single clamp I own and clamped the heap together. Yep. Okay. Yeah. After repeating on the second block, I let everything set up overnight. With both glue-ups done, I moved on to figuring out how to join them together. The first obstacle was to get a flat face on each of the blocks, which will allow me to smush them together. The only tool I can make this happen was the chainsaw. I watched a video put out by fellow YouTuber John Peters on how to get a straight cut using a chainsaw. It is a brilliant method that is very easy to set up, where you essentially attach two by fours directly to your glue-up to act as rails. The objective is to temporarily place blocks on the bar of the saw to ride flat up against these rails on the glue up. This is far easier than trying to maintain a perfectly flat blade riding on the rails alone. I used some one by material for my block and glued them to the bar using Instabond by Titebond. This is a very fast setting CA glue. <laughs> And don't worry, when done, the blocks come off easily enough with a few taps from a hammer. So here you can see how the system works. The blocks on the bar rest against the rails on the glue up, making it easy to keep the bar flat through the entire cut. Of course, I took my time making sure I wasn't lifting up on either side of the blade and slowed down near the end of the cut so I wouldn't punch through and get into my porch post. Whoa! That's awesome. I was extremely impressed with this method of cutting and also love getting a sneak peek inside how well that glue up was. Even though the setup worked far better than me trying two cuts freehand, I still ended up with a small gap in between my two blocks, which I'll address how I fix in a minute. Moving on to joining the two glue ups together, I wanted to use two lengths of dowels, but this was a little tricky. Not only because of how deep the holes needed to be, but also locating two holes accurately from one block to the other. It was important when drilling these holes to get them very straight so that when I combine the two blocks, one wouldn't be shooting off from an odd angle. To help guide my drill bit, I made two drill guides over at the drill press. Next, I went three rounds with my drill and bit to get these holes punched. Even with cleaning the cutout often, it was a battle drilling such deep holes with a standard drill instead of using a whole hog. But I made what I had work. <laughs> huh. 
the holes drilled, I cut some dowels to length and also cut in a spiral relief so that it wouldn't lock up on me when I applied the glue and stuck it in the hole. Next, I began the process for joining the two, using Type Bond 3 once again here on the dowels, measuring to make sure I was inserting them far enough in, and of course applying more glue to the rest of the dowel before joining the second block to the first. <laughs> this is such a fun project. And I won't lie, it took a little bit more persuasion than expected, but I got it done. Sledge. Oh boy. Is this moving? Six and a half. Let's see. Five and a quarter. some straps I address that small gap between the two. See wood glue isn't made to expand and fill voids so I added some two-part epoxy into the gap. I used a bead of hot glue on the bottom and the two sides of the glue up to prevent the epoxy from being able to run straight out. After the gap wouldn't take any more I let everything set up overnight. And to go back to what I said at the start, if you do a similar project, but use brand new six by sixes instead of piecemealing scraps together, then all you'll need to do is join a few edges on each and do one massive glue up. You can avoid all of these other challenges that I've gone through to get to this point. Alrighty, prep work is done. Let's move on to the actual carving stage. I began by using a marker to draw the spoon on the block. Well, actually, I really started by modeling the entire carving in clay. You'll see that I had to deviate from this model slightly because my glue up wasn't tall enough to replicate it. But even so, having this clay model was a huge help on this project. After liking my drawing, I threw on all my safety gear, which included my Isotunes Bluetooth hearing protection, chaps, gloves, and even though I didn't start off wearing a respirator, I very quickly added it to the list of items. For the first big rough cuts, I used the Steel Farm Boss 271 chainsaw, although I did make some modifications for it to read Mrs. Farm Boss, as I thought it was only appropriate. After getting the top of the spoon roughed in, I flipped the block upside down to work on the base. You can see that I had a different plan for the base in my clay model, and I really prefer it over what turned out to be. However, I simply did not have enough meat on the block to make it happen, so I improvised something instead. Once the rough cuts were off and the spoon shape was coming out, I switched over to using the Still 181 chainsaw with an actual carving bar on it. It's awesome having a larger saw around to get rid of the bulk material, but the heavier saw really takes a toll on the forearms, shoulders, and biceps. So it's nice to have another option that is a little bit more lightweight, but still powerful. This 181 allowed me to maneuver around the piece, defining the shape in some pretty difficult areas, such as the curved head and the neck. Before moving on to shaping the front, I switched from chainsaws to using my angle grinder with an Arbortech turboplane attachment in. This is a spectacular wood carving tool that excels at leveling out large surfaces quickly, but can also do curves and shallow cuts just as easily. Moving on to the front, I switched back to my carving bar and cut in a line that will help define the spoon from the base. And this is a big standout with having an actual carving bar. Unlike a regular blade where using the tip is a no-go because it leads to kickback, a carving bar is specifically made so carvers can safely use it in their work. You can see I started off by trying to make this cut with the block on the horses, but found it much easier to take the time to move the spoon to the ground so that I could work in a more controlled stance. With that defined, I used a marker to line out the bowl of the spoon so that I could start whittling on that. 
For this task, I installed a ball gouge attachment on my grinder. And I must say, this was a pretty cool tool. I started in the center to get used to the tool first, then moved to using it along the bowl's line. I once again started with the spoon on its base, but quickly flipped it to its back to make this task easier. I made a few passes around the perimeter of the bowl to define its side walls, then started carving away the material on the inside. I was pretty impressed with just how flat I was able to get the bottom of the bowl with using this attachment alone. I first went down about two inches. However, after standing it up and looking at it, I decided I needed it to go a little bit deeper. Since the walls were already defined, I switched back to the turboplane attachment to really hog away the material quickly. Once getting down to the depth I wanted, I made light passes to try and keep the transition from the walls to the bottom smooth and easy. I came back after with the Arbortech mini grinder with the sanding attachment on to smooth things out. I not only used this nimble but powerful attachment to clean things up in the bowl of the spoon, but also any other areas that my regular ROS wouldn't get. But then areas like the handle and the head, I used my random orbital sander, starting off with 100 grit sandpaper to quickly smooth things out. Then switching over to my palm random orbital sander and using 120 grit paper. That completes the giant spoon portion, but let's move on to the draw knife. My extremely talented and unstoppable best friend hand forged the tool in her backyard setup. It is only for display purposes, so she forged it from mild steel. Anne has a complete video out on her YouTube channel showing the entire process, so be sure to check it out. There is a link down in the description below for you. Instead of cutting the tangs, which are the pointy bits that go into the wooden handles at the end, she did it the traditional way of heating and stretching out the material until she liked the length and width. Gosh, she is so impressive. <laughs> she also forged the bevel of the draw knife, bent the handles to their proper angle, then made some custom oak handles that were slightly undersized so that she could insert the burning tangs into them and create a perfect fit. I then cut a slit into the handle of the spoon and attached the draw knife using tight bond two, which is water resistant and it can also adhere metal to wood. Using some paracord to hold it in place while it cured, I gave the entire spoon a coating of semi-transparent stain in the color of cedar. There was a lot more to this project than what I was expecting, but it was very fun and challenging working through all the obstacles that kept popping up. Be sure to check out Anne's channel to see the video on the draw knife or any of her other incredible videos, and I will see you on whatever it is I'm building next. Shalom. Ah, oh, this is so cool!